Welcome to the African American Experience, week two by remote. So continuing from where we left off and expanding a bit, talking about uh, memes and how they are, it's a 21st, a 20th, late 20th century concept that's been expanded into the 21st century. So to give it a fresh flavor, I want to show you a, a meme in the opening slide. So in Microsoft PowerPoint, even though uh, this particular slide motif is called medical, the caduceus, which is a comedian or Egyptian word uh, for the seven spheres of Ra, and what the seven spheres of Ra are, are what are called in classical Indian literature chakra. Now, yoga came from Africa. In fact, it, it came from Egypt. And what this symbol is, is basically the seven chakras, or as they're known in India, or the seven spheres of Ra, and where these two snakes, so you have the snakes who are entwining around a central rod. What that central rod is, is the spine, and the two snakes are two lunar and solar channels that entwine and combine at the chakra points. So starting at where their tail is, that's the first chakra, second chakra, every time they entwine, first, second, third, fourth, fifth at the throat, and at the third eye point, the two snakes are staring, that's the sixth chakra, and then the seventh chakra is basically representing, representing the globe. But where the two snakes are staring at, the third eye point, Whenever you see that symbolized within Egyptian uh, symbology, anytime you see a snake coming out of somebody's third eye, it means that person is awakened being or a winged being. And that means that they could also heal people. So that was the association with the caduceus and medicine. And so that's a meme that exists, uh, you know, actually a fairly successful meme, even though people don't necessarily understand where that meme came from. But I explained it to you to show you that memes, even though it's a relatively new concept, is an ancient uh, idea. So when we talk about, for example, where we left off last time, so the idea of a word tree. So First, a person is named for a place, where you were from. There was no concept of race in the ancient world and no concept of the negativity of race. So you were, who you were is where you were from. Just like there was that original meme that I talked about, it's not your homeland unless your people have been there for at least a hundred generations and preferably a thousand. And the longer you've been in there, that's definitely who you are and where you're from. So that's why people's place names were who they were. You know, somebody from, or you know, somebody's son of, or somebody daughter of, etc. So, play, word tree. So place, pride, slur, and slang. The way a word has morphed. So just like we were talking about Niger, if you go to slide, please. Niger and Nigeria the Niger River, and that's, I'm using the French pronunciation, Niger, where the G is softer, or Niger, where the Germanic or English pronunciation, Nigeria, that's a place name. The word Africa is a Greek name for that continent, which means land of the blacks, like al Kabulan, which is from an indigenous language to that continent. It may also means land of the blacks. So, when we start about from place names, Niger, Nigeria, and Africa, so that's a place name. A Nagar is a person from that place. So a Nagar is a person from Africa, generically. And when you move from Nagar in the original language to Neger, which is German, it's still a person from a place, and it's a source of pride. So that's why you can have, if you move back down from uh, uh, where we start with swert, which is Latin, which means dark, that's again from the American Heritage Dictionary. Swarthy, when somebody's described as swarthy, it means dark complexion or color. 
So for example, in uh, biographies of Beethoven where they describe him as swarthy, uh, they're saying he's darker than a German. So the only way you can get darker in Germany, because it's not a tanning destination, is to have it in your genes. Schwartz means black in German. Schwarzkopf literally means black head. Schwarzenegger, black and from Africa. Now, you name yourself about where you're, that you're proud that you're from there. So Arnold has actually you know, been on camera to talk about how you know, he, he basically meant, because uh, Letterman, I believe it was, asked him, what does your name mean? And he says, oh, I'm a black plowman. Black plowman is what it means. So black farmer from Germany. So they were you know, actually proud that they were from Africa, Schwarzenegger. You move into other language groups. Uh, go back to the slide, please. Uh, Abyssinian, Abak, basically is Ethiopia, so Russian. Abakidze, Arab, also Arab. So you could have a surname, Arapov, which basically meant you were a black Russian. Aksakov, same thing. And Shimon Afrikanovich, as I said before, was a black trader, that's trader with a D. Uh, who traveled between Africa and Russia in about the year 1000 AD. So if he dwelled for any particular time in traveling through Europe, and he would be well known, then he could call him an Afro-European, using that, mo that uh, uh, mean. So other names for black people throughout history, Moor, like a fellow, the Moor in Shakespeare, a Turk, a young Turk, could be, you know, this is when Turks were considered black people. Blackamoor, uh, used also in Shakespearean, but also throughout Europe. Basically, it's an English word. Black and, you know, a moor from Africa, from the Greek uh, and Latin names for black people. Moors or Mars. Uh, mulatto, a Portuguese slaver term, which is a first-generation black-white mix. Quadroon, person who's one-fourth black, Octoroon, person who's one-eighth black, and then various skin color tone memes, high yellow, red bone, specifically uh, apply to black people, red bone meaning that you're mixed with a Native American. So these memes basically came, uh, evolved originally from place names to then skin color. And when it became involved with skin color, then it became amenable to being uh, essentially a racial slur, an ethnic slur. So when we have the evolution from negar to negger to nigger uh, in hip-hop where they basically talk, say niggas collectively and it becomes an acronym, never ignorant, gaining goals always, N-I-G-G-A. So niggas with a Z becomes a plural for never ignorant, gaining goals always. So Basically, it's reframing the nigger as an ethnic slur into a term uh, that's more prideful. Spanish, negro, meaning black. Nigra, that is American Southern English, where they're trying to, you know, combine negro and nigger and trying to be respectful somewhat because it's more respectful in color, the nigra. So that's basically Southern English, and that's where that particular framework came from. And then we can see how the meme has morphed then. So when we look at it from a, in a cultural paradigm where assimilation is essentially uh, pouring your ethnic diversity into a melting pot and pouring it out so you become no longer ethnic, no longer a separate ethnic, you're uh, American. And then you get poured out into mainstream America where your European ethnic identity has been erased and you're simply an American. Where even though you may claim an immigrant identity, you're not an immigrant anymore, you're not from there anymore, you're an American, as Justice Scalia would have it. So the idea of mainstream America, when they talk about mainstream America, they basically say it's not about, that, like the Constitution says, you're an American, it means a white American. So in other words, not everybody gets to melt in the melting pot. Uh, but that came out of essentially a particular point of view 
which looked at colonialism as being a good thing. We want to be like the mother country, the conquering cult country. So acculturation uh, is basically where in the salad bowl approach you can have different kinds of lettuce, different kinds of tomatoes, they all retain their ethnic identity as a positive, but they take on cultural artifacts while maintaining their particular identity, and that's how I framed it, that acculturation is basically you simply maintaining your ethnic identity, but learning how to use chopsticks, or learning how to use the fork that's the salad fork. Now, Europeans didn't always use cutlery. It was only the working class people that used cutlery. So when we talk about cutlery, basically the royalty basically ate with their hands and threw the leavings on the floor for the dogs and the poor children to pick up and they ate with their hands and had washing bowls for their hands. Poor people, particularly those who worked in coal miners, invented forts so that not having indoor plumbing, they would come home from the mines and they still needed to eat because they were hungry, so they created forts so they wouldn't have to actually touch their food because their hands were dirty because they were working. So that's where forks and knives, so you could basically cut your food and eat your food without actually having to touch your food because you were a working person. So when we talk about now salad fork, knowing which fork is a salad fork is a, you know, a uh, cultural act affectation of being higher class, Originally, the higher classes ate with their hands, and now eating with your hands, except for finger food, is considered de classe, if you will. So, assimilation, acculturation, and the viral mimetic paradigm, which I simply, uh, being introduced to mimetic, the concept of memes in the late 80s, basically looked at, okay, there's something happening here that isn't accounted for in the literature. So the viral mimetic paradigm. So there are different means for cross-cultural transmission. Uh, the melting pot came from an immigrant paradigm. Acculturation came from people of color saying, okay, we think that our ethnic identity is a good thing and we're going to retain it, particularly because mainstream America isn't accepting this anyway and we can't melt in the melting pot, nor do we want to. So when I talked about creating the construct of viral mimetic paradigm, it was part of the idea that, uh, well, the melting, the acculturation salad bowl thing doesn't work for some people as well. So the idea out of anthropology, assimilation is erasing an emic culture in favor of an etic one, usually by conquest. So emic is the study of a culture from within the culture in anthropology. Etic, which is usually the position of anthropology, is studying a culture from out, as a cultural outsider and making observations. So when I was talking last week about stereotypes come from an etic culture observing the behavior of an emic culture, and archetypes come from within an emic culture and are basically generated by the experience of that culture, that's I'm basically mimetically melding anthropology with Western anthropology with Western psychology. So assimilation is erasing an internal culture in favor of a dominating culture, usually by conquest. That's why we refer to dominant culture, that's where that meme comes from. And acculturation is taking on cultural artifacts and practices without erasing your own. So the melting pot basically is assimilation. The flame of freedom melts down ethnic differences into a mainstream American culture, so f therefore the American identity becomes one where you don't know where your great-grandfather wa was, or you don't speak the language of your great-grandfather or great-grandmother or your forebears. You might know vaguely you might come from Ireland or Scotland or Germany or Russia, but you don't speak their, those languages, nor are those histories taught. So basically to be an American, as almost a mainstream American, is basically to be a historical. So the salad bowl, acculturation, taking on those cultural artifacts and practices without erasing your own, which fork is a salad fork, can you use chopsticks, 
do you belch uh, at, at the table uh, to honor your host, or is that considered impolite, et cetera, et cetera, those things. So culture itself is a virus, okay? And culture adapts its hosts, or its hosts adapt to survival conditions, or survival in less than optimal conditions. You have cultures that basically are created in either way in those particular ways. Sometimes an old survival pattern is retained long after the harsh conditions have ended. So then you can actually define a culture that's a culture of resistance to a dominant culture that that dominant culture may in fact define as criminal or less than sane. So when I've talked about in the early week of the class about the fact that Slaves escaping slavery were seen by uh, white Southern scientists as manifesting insanity. You're crazy for escaping slavery. You're a criminal if you steal yourself because you're property. That was the dominant worldview. You're not a human being. You're less than a human being. And if you steal yourself or somebody steals you, well, that's theft of property. So that was from the worldview of in, set by the Constitution that black people are less than whites, unless you know they're somehow equal, but they're only equal in economic terms. So, sometimes an old survival pattern is retained long after the harsh conditions have ended um, as uh, an adaptation to what, what current conditions are. Or often, a culture fails to adapt to the conditions that are about to transpire. Uh, because life is change, and sometimes if you're holding on to an old cultural artifact uh, that was basically created before you had contact with another uh, culture with superior weaponry that's about to conquer you, you can't necessarily hold on to the old ways, and we'll be seeing how that works shortly. So, for example, one of the many nations in Turtle Island, uh, the Hopis. So Hopi prophecy uh, basically predicted the coming of whites to Turtle Island. This is way before 1492, so North America. Uh, so it predicted the coming of whites to Turtle Island. It predicted Hitler and the end of World War II, in which two cities would be destroyed by gourd of ash falling from the sky and that some of the spirits of the native people would be born among the whites, and that these people would wear colors, beads, and feathers in their hair. They would be close to the land, and their name would be similar to Hopi. And that's part of Hopi prophecy, before white people even came, came here. So the whole thing with Hitler is that there is a Navajo Hopi motif, symbolic motif called the whirling logs, in which we would call it a swastika from... The, so, for example, if I drew this, in Indian country, often when we pray and we basically do tobacco prayers, we start in the east where the sun rises, and then we proceed sunwise, you would call it clockwise. So prayer to the east, south, west, north, father, son, mother, earth, all my relations, right? And one of the ways of symbolizing this, the whirling logs, the direction moves sunwise. This is also from my American Heritage Dictionary, right? So... You can see the whirling logs are whirling and they're moving in a sunrise, sunwise direction and this is the forces of life. Everything moving in the forces of life, like the sun does, sunwise, clockwise, if you will. Now, what they, did, what they, they first predicted the coming of whites to Turtle Island, so they knew about whites before Turtle Island got, before whites came to Turtle Island originally, or at least in the white narrative, 1492. So Hopi prophecy is several thousand years ago. It's inscribed in, uh, uh, in petroglyphs, I believe in New Arrivi, uh, in Arizona or New Mexico. Uh, and 
becoming the whites of Turtle Island, and that as a result, a number of a lot of native people would die. Uh, and part of that whole process was that there was going to be a world war in which a sim which was going to be symbolized by a white man reversing the forces of life in a symbol where a lot of people were going to die. And that symbol, the Nazi swastika, moving counterclockwise, and is a symbol of death. And the end of that war, there would be two cities that would be destroyed by a gourd of ash. So a gourd looks like this. Pouring ash. Now, if you were going to describe a mushroom cloud and you didn't have nuclear physics, what would it look like? Boom. Like that. And there's more to that story, and I'm not going to get into it, but uh, if you want to, um, there's a book written by a Native American psychiatrist, uh, Eduardo Durand. His book is called um, Buddha in Red Face, in which he describes a scenario in which there was a ceremony several hundred years ago uh, in Los Alamos in a cave in which tobacco and hot rocks, that is uranium, were combined in a ceremony to attempt to drive the whites away. And when you use spiritual energy in a way that's a weapon, it often rebounds on you. Since natives were there and a Japanese person was there, the energy rebounded on them, Native Americans resulting in death, disease, child abuse, and with uh, the Japanese person, uh, basically it rebounded on, against the Japanese uh, with the two cities being destroyed by atomic energy. So what happened several hundred years ago is they had this ceremony and on that land, as described in the book, uh, Duran's grandfather, owned uh, the land as a native person, had cattle and sheep there, and Robert Oppenheimer, one of the founders of the bomb, the creators of the atomic bomb, came through with the army, slaughtered all the man's sheep and cattle, smoking a pipe, and built the bomb on that spot, and that's where Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory is, where they created the bomb, near the cave where it's depicted uh, that this particular ceremony took place. And so part of his book was basically describing you know, what his work was, which is to bring healing to native people, to white people, and Asian people in the area. So Buddha in Red Face by Eduardo Duran. So the idea then, going back to slide, if you will, right? Hopi prophecy predicted those different things. So whether you consider it a meme or not, or true or not, they believe it, and uh, since none of this necessarily happened, uh, is not really taught as in terms of mainstream history, basically what they're saying is that within their particular framework, native, a lot of native people were going to die, some of the spirits of the native people would be born among the whites, and that these people would wear colors, beads, and feathers in their hair, and they would be close to the land, and the name would be similar to Hopi, hippie. So if you take the basic meme, the original meme of Hopis, which was basically uh, evolved over tens of thousands of years within their framework, uh, but easily tens of thousands of years, whether you believe natives came on a land bridge from wherever, in their framework, look, we've always been here, and that's their worldview, and I will not dispute that. They've definitely been here, fitting the basic protocol of been here for a hundred or a thousand generations. Either way you slice it, they've been here that long. So, the original meme originated in relation to the land and with other sets of people. Part of the meme of being a Hopi is Hopis are peacekeepers. They don't have a warrior tradition. People around them have warrior traditions, but Hopis are considered to be the, heart keep, the keepers of the heartbeat uh, of Mother Earth, especially the sacred lands around where they traditionally are. 
and they don't fight. So when you have the first person to die in the Gulf War being a Hopi woman, I'm not diminishing her sacrifice, but Hopis don't fight. Okay? They are spiritual people. They're peaceful people. So th the fact that a Hopi woman, hopefully single mom, was the first person to die in combat in Iraq, that means that America is not preserving her culture because she has to fight. She has to join the army to support herself as a single mom. And she got put in, you know, maybe it wasn't intended for her to be in combat, but basically what I'm saying, the basic meme of Hopi, she actually had to assimilate and erase her native culture to become part of the army. Because Hopis don't fight. They're peaceful people. So, go back to slide. So the original meme, Hopi, was generated with certain memes and uh, vir viral ideas intact. And then, if you notice, the hippie meme, basically hippies could emulate some of the more obvious memes, you know, the flowers, the you know, love of the earth, and all that other kind of flowers and beads in their hair, etc., etc., but not the internal culture. So it has been observed that essentially hippies are white middle class people who are adopting the cultural memes of people of color and more particularly in terms of drug laws, also the, substances, the sacred substances of people of color. Because in this time when the hippies exist, it is still illegal for Native Americans to even practice their religion. But because of white privilege, the hippies can take on aspects of Native American religion and name yourself, you know, moon water, desert flower, whatever your name is, whatever your assimilated name that is not on your uh, driver's license. So, memes combine to form viral ideas which can mutate over time given diverse environments. So the original meme is Hopi, and then Hippies, that is, non-natives, emulate different aspects of what they see of Native American culture, but their core culture is different and alien from Native American culture. So the cultural core then evolves differently. And if, I, if by this graphic I'm you know, trying to indicate that this meme is different from that meme or is degraded from that meme, then you can draw that conclusion logically. So Hopi Hippie, Native Nation tribe, culture that arose under specific survival conditions and beliefs. The external beliefs are the ones that are emulatable or copyable by non-Hopi culture. White culture doesn't believe in reincarnation. The part of Hopi prophecy which holds that natives reincarnate as whites is not likely to be believed in mainstream culture. Thus hippies simply become a way for whites to emulate the external values of Native culture to protest the values of white culture that they seem to be resisting. So, two, these are two mimetic ways of seeing which is true. So whether it's the Hopi belief of, oh, well, you're a reincarnated native, or you're a protest culture, either meme can work to explain the behavior. So let's talk about drug dealing gangs, which is a phenomenon that comes up within this culture as well. So drug dealing gangs have been part of the United States for more than 150 years. At this writing, it's about 170. The original gangs were ethnic Europeans who faced discrimination because they were not white, i.e., when white was defined as white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, i.e., wasps. Okay? So, ethnic Europeans, so people from Europe, but who were not white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, were not considered white. So, for example, wasps then theorized the gang's criminality were part of their ethnic culture. In fact, they literally wrote that. They're basically saying that Bohemians, Swedes, Dutch, Norwegians, Russians, Jews, Italians, all being inferior to white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, 
had criminal elements as part of their ethnic identities and as part of their ethnic culture. So basically, wasp theorizing that, oh, you know, the best thing to be is a wasp. We're the superior white race, and you people, you Bohemian races, you Swedish races, you Dutch races, you Irish races, you Scottish races, literally, where you were from was your race. Okay, so this is the earlier meme when we were talking about place names. Who you were was where you were from. So you were saying, oh, now in the 19th century and in the 17th century, these races are from places that had nothing to do necessarily with skin color. These folks, the wasps, were basically saying that these ethnic Europeans were inferior, and they were inferior because they were criminal. Not looking at the fact that you're not hiring these folks, once they come off the boat. So when we have the ethnic slur WAP for Italians, it means without official papers. Meaning you just paid your way on a boat without contacting the consulate and you're here illegally. Italians were illegal immigrants. Bohemians were illegal immigrants. Okay, white ethnic Europeans were illegal immigrants. There were laws and practices, for example, in New York City that no Irish need apply for a job. And they would actually use Irish people and other people, other ethnic Europeans on jobs that they considered too dangerous for black slaves to do because black slaves in this conception were of property and therefore more valuable than the ethnic immigrant who could be used for dangerous work, similar to with the Chinese. Chinese weren't being enslaved, but they were less than property. So we can have them working in the gold mines, we can have them working the railroads, and that's preferable to using slaves because slaves are valuable property. Right? So, drug dealing gangs then started with ethnic Europeans who were not allowed to do legal work. And were forbidden to do legal work. So, they have to do illegal work. So the fact that you have an above-ground economy means that you're going to have an underground economy. So the above-ground economy, just like we have today, where just like I said the other day, um, 80, and when Reagan was saying just say no, 80% of the illegal drug users in the United States are white men who make an excessive $50,000. Now that's not the majority of white people, but it is definitely an influential minority who, while consuming illegal drugs, are getting their illegal drugs from people who have to break the law, who are often stereotypically ethnic minorities. This is the same pattern that's been established 170 years ago, where even when you have, for example, prohibition, who's running rum? It's ethnic European gangs. Irish. Italians, etc. So what happens is the gangs are trying to meet their needs economically because they're forbidden to work in the above ground economy because of discrimination and then they're able to use their power and influence and their money to send their kids to school so that their kids don't have to do illegal stuff anymore. That's essentially where you get Kennedys from. So they say, oh, well, Joseph Kennedy made his money in real estate. Well, how does an Irishman who's an illegal have that kind of money? Where does it get? Well, yes, Kennedy's father was also rich. Joe Kennedy's father was also rich, but Irish were discriminated against. How did they get their money? If you run run during prohibition, that's illegal, that's a drug dealing gang, right? So, drug dealing gangs have an old history in the United States. So, purposes from the gangs theory from the literature. Um, 1927, Thrasher's famous study, gangs arise from immigrant communities because immigrant communities are criminal. And he's basically saying that. 55, Cohen, gangs arise as a rebellion against middle class values. This is the James Dean rebel without a cause you know, the white youth wearing Levi's and white t-shirts with um, cigarettes rolled up in their uh, shirt sleeves. That's that kind of gang. 
1960, Cloward and Olin, gangs provide a deviant avenue to attain normal goals when young people are blocked in their efforts to seek material gains or status through legitimate means. So basically they're saying, oh, world discrimination exists, that's why people are going into gangs because they don't seem like they have a legitimate path to that. 64, gangs are attempt to sort out identity and gain peer group acceptance. 72, gangs arise as a protest to counter bureaucratic cruelties of minority status, which means, oh, there's still systemic discrimination. That hasn't been eliminated. Even in 1972, we're still in the civil rights movement here. 1992, gang members come from families that <coughs> experience greater poverty, substance abuse, chronic illness, and familial involvement with law enforcement and corrections, uh, multi-generational familial involvement. The gang provides what families cannot at that point after experiencing greater poverty. So greater poverty is not an accident. Martin Luther King basically talked about poverty is violence, and poverty is violence on the hands of uh, mainstream America by designing systems that discriminate against people and replicating those. So the gang provides what the families cannot <clears throat> through the structures, the legal structures of the system. So affection, understanding, loyalty, recognition, and emotional and physical protection some gangs are multi-generational. It's a Latino that's basically doing this work. And uh, the reason, you know, I stopped for in 1992, though there is research on gangs uh, since then. Uh, I was the first one that I noticed talking about um, the viral memantic paradigm because you had to basically be able to explain the following. So why did the setup with the viral culture as a virus and transmission of uh, the culture, the gang virus, if you will, or the gang meme? The viral mimetic paradigm I developed to explain why white kids joined quote unquote black style slash LA style gangs. Now, in 1992, when I first represented the gang the Lane Community College on the Gang Task Force here in Eugene, law enforcement was referring to 80%, basically they said 80% of the illegal gang members were white kids in, the, in Oregon. And the way they were referring to them is they were join, these white kids were joining black style gangs. And, but, they, but you can't call them black style gangs unless well, especially if there's majority white kids, that doesn't make sense. It's a cognitive dissonance. So they refer to it as LA style, like that's still a racial code word, LA style, the gangs. Well, yeah, uh, black style gangs, LA style, like that's different, not really. The literature at the time didn't seem to want to take their involvement seriously. And in fact, law enforcement basically called them wannabes i.e. they will age out of it. They're just playing minority and they'll eventually get hip and you know, once they get you know, put in jail, they're going to change their ways and stop acting like they're black and stop listening to rap music, doing drive-by shootings and drinking 40s. They'll just age out of it. It's just youthful rebellion. Well, guess what? That didn't happen. That didn't happen. So now, we have the proliferation of that phenomenon pretty much unabated. So, why would white kids want to be black? One could ask that question. And that question didn't seem to be being asked by white people. So, I did. And basically, one of the things that they said when I asked them is, they felt that white culture was whack in that early hip-hop parlance. They saw the contradictions of racism, systemic discrimination, and even when their family was wealthy or well-to-do. So, for example, you know, I guess the stereotypical story that I have talked about, so it was a real experience. I'm walking down uh, 13th Avenue uh, in basically uh, when, when we're having the gang task force, so we're working down 13th Avenue and uh, Agate. 
And I hear, what's up, nigger? So I look, figure out, okay, there's no black people, they must be talking to me. So I step to him, it's two white kids, saying, what's up, nigger? So I step to him. I go, what's up with the what's up, nigger? They go, oh, no, not you. Respect. We weren't talking to you. No, really, what's up with the what's up, nigger? Uh, we're 7-4 Hoover Crips. Where are you from? Okay, they're throwing up a gang identification. We're 7-4 Hoover Crips. Where are you from? We're 7-4 Hoover Crips. No, stop. I'm from 48th and Dinker in L.A. So I know you're not from 74th and Hoover. Where are you from? Uh, Beaverton. Okay, right. So somebody from 7-4 jumped you in. In Portland? Yeah. Okay, so I understood that gangs moved up the I-5 corridor to put in work because, basically, in order to have a drug problem, what supports the gangs being, you know, supplying <laughs> rich white people drugs, you need an international airport, you need a seaport, and you need transportation. So you move up the I-5 corridor to supply the people that the mafia is no longer supplying because the mafia isn't into dope anymore. The mafia owns insurance companies and record companies and media and all kinds of other legitimate businesses, so they don't need to bother with street drug sales. So that's why the gangs also have prol proliferated because the immigrant communities who used to not be considered white were able to assimilate into mainstream culture, creating a vacuum of use. That is, people, rich white people, who are still the majority drug users, still have that hunger, and it cannot be fed simply by minorities driving drugs up the I-5 corridor. They have to use planes. They have to use, you know, container ships. There, there's a lot more consumption than uh, is being you know, talked about. So drug dealing gangs happen to be the street soldiers and what these kids talking about while, you know, whose parents were lawyers and school teachers in Beaverton, well why do you want to be a black gang member? Why did you get jumped into the gang? Because it's obviously not economic. Well, white culture is whack. It's racist. We don't like the contradictions. We hear a certain level of truth telling in rap music, so we're down with fighting that because we're not seeing a viable civil, we're not gonna join the NAACP, we're not seeing a viable protest to it. So it's very similar, so I asked them, is your grandma a hippie? Well, yeah, okay. So, so there are some people that think that this is a stretch, that gang members are a protest culture. Well, that's what they are saying. Otherwise, you know, what, why is the justification for criminal behavior? Oh, because they're just bad? Because they come from a criminal culture? Uh, that's not working so well. How's that analysis working for you? Not so much. Why would white kids want to be black? Why would you want to be something that everybody talks negatively about? As you saw from last week's uh, analysis of the dictionary. Why would you want to be black? What is it about black people that you like? And so what they said is the level of truth-telling about what the real deal is. So, in any case, black street gangs arose out of a combination of reaction to racism where the mainstream institutions were not protecting them. Okay, so that is a fact. Particularly, the Crips and Bloods came out of the Black Panthers and the US organization, which came out of the Slossons and the Businessmen and the Gladiator, who were basically black street gangs who were organized for self-defense against white gangs like the Spook Hunters, who basically were attacking black people in LA when they considered uh, L.A. and places like Inglewood that were considered white neighborhoods. Inglewood was once all white. Watts was once all white. So black people started moving from Central Avenue. Central Avenue in Los Angeles once was the heart of the black community. That's why we call, refer to the black community as South Central. 
black people were not allowed to move west of Central Avenue. So the black community was along the railroad line where Central Avenue was in Los Angeles, and then LAPD basically run a, ran a protection racket and basically was skimming off of gambling, prostitution. They were making a piece out of all the black businesses because black people were also largely not allowed to have legitimate businesses, or if they did, they weren't allowed to move into areas which weren't integrated, so they were kept within a very narrow geographical area, had their own jazz clubs, had their own businesses, some legal, some illegal, some legal, some illegal. There was a lot of corruption within the LAPD, and the LAPD also recruited Klansmen and ex-military from the South. Klansmen and the ex and mil white Southern military men are not known for their love of black people. So when you combine the spook hunters, whose logo was a black person hanging, okay, and so they were attacking black people, you had the response of black people organizing themselves into protective organizations, gladiators, spook hunters, not sp gladiators, Slossons and the businessmen. And the core of those self-protection gangs in Los Angeles evolved into different cells within the Black Panthers. Okay? And remember the Black Panther Party for self-defense was basically organized at first to deal with police brutality because you can't call the police on the police, particularly if the police are being racist. When I was growing up, you could st a black person stood a 50-50 chance of surviving an encounter with any law enforcement on routine traffic stops. They, you'd a they'd ask you for your wallet, you go for your wallet, they shoot you in front of your pregnant wife or whatever on the way to the hospital. So part of the reaction then, black street gangs arose not out of a criminal context necessarily, but a reaction to racism where mainstream institutions, i.e. the police, were not protecting them, were actually even colluding with uh, white supremacist gang members hurting people in the black community. So, Slossons, again, black gang formed to protect black citizens from the LAPD and the spook hunters who reinforced, attempted to reinforce seg segregation. The LAPD of the 40s recruited ex-military whites from the South, conservative and racist. They did not screen them for Klan membership. Recently, there was a news item about a uh, police chief who actually did, uh, as part of the recruitment process, ask if people were part of white supremacists or Klan and was screening them out. But that was not a standard feature in any, or in <laughs> any police department in Oregon to this day, even though the Ku Klux Klan historically in this state did in fact uh, recruit heavily in law enforcement. That had not been, starting in the 1930s. Now, there has never been a concerted effort to stop that or screen people out to this day. So. If people have the attitude about, oh, blow, black teenagers are more dangerous than, say, Kip Kinkle, where's the evidence to back that up? How many black kids have done school shootings in this area? Or even nationally. Sure, gang members shoot each other, but they don't necessarily shoot up schools in mass shootings or theaters or whatever. So, Eugene clan membership was seen as a desirable quality, a good thing at one point for many institutions. So, Slossons became the core of the Black Panthers who morphed into CRIPS. CRIP is an acronym, Community Revolution in Progress. Or you know, there's another acronym that basically talks about what CRIP is, but basically it's pro-social. And the US organization morphed into the Bloods. So gangs then grew into criminal organizations without the political or social justice mimetic core that formed the basis of the Black Panther Party or the African Black Nationalist Corps that formed Karenga's Us. So Black Panthers are not just organized against to deal with police. They also had 85 separate social programs, including 
free heroin drug detox, free, um, free breakfast program. So for example, in Eugene, the Black Panther Party uh, had a running a free breakfast program run out of a largely white church that catered to mostly white kids. Um, so Black Panther Party had 85 social programs, when, which we'll discuss when we get to the 60s. And uh, the US organization was uh, basically a black cultural nationalist organization. So none, neither one of them were inherently criminal, though they were targeted by the police. Now, I grew up in Los Angeles during this era. And other than the Slossons, businessmen, and the gladiators, there were no gangs. And those gangs were not criminal. Those gangs were self-defense. Once the Black Panthers got into, or into it, there were no street gangs in Los Angeles. They disappeared as a criminal phenomenon. I'm not saying that black crime disappeared, but I am saying during the Panther era, no gangs existed. Gangs arose after law enforcement destroyed the Black Panther Party and also targeted us members. And then after that, we started seeing these drug dealing gang phenomena, and we'll go into that. But the viral mimetic paradigm zone, basically saying, why are white kids joining these black gangs? Well, they're joining post partially as a protest. Crips in the Bloods were originally coming out of cultural responses to racism. So that is part of their mimetic core, even though they've morphed from social justice organizations into quasi-criminal, and I'm not saying quasi to, you know, basically deny that they have criminal elements. Yes, they do, but that's not where they came from. 